Welcome, and thank you for joining me. We're at the beginning of a critical decade in human history. This talk summarizes the key actions that need to be agreed by the end of 2020 to deliver a sustainable future by 2030. This slide is the uh, latest COVID figures from John Hopkins University, and we've reached a grim milestone of 1 million deaths globally. Global response is speeded up with unprecedented levels of club, uh, collaboration between uh, countries and, and uh, industry to hopefully create a vaccine by next year. Now imagine a future where there could be up to 4.5 million deaths a year. Well, that future is already with us. It's the climate change and biodiversity emergency. The result of this is uh, we emit 37 billion tonnes of CO2. This was in 2018. A third of this is from our buildings and construction in the planet uh, over the world, 40% in the UK, and the Earth at its best can only absorb half that amount of CO2. At the same time, we're cutting uh, forests down at unprecedented level. Uh, we see here, this is the, one of the latest images from Amazon, and it's the size of the UK per year that we're cutting down uh, globally. That's taken to a point now where we've got two futures. The future on the left is if we try and reduce uh, global emissions down uh, by 2% per year for the next 30 years, or ideally if we can achieve a 7.6% reduction for the next 10 years, uh, this will create an increase of about 1.5 degrees centigrade. And remember, all the problems we're having now is on 1.1 degrees increase. So if we double it, we triple it, then obviously it gets worse. The future on the right is if we do nothing and uh, it's between 4 and 8 degrees centigrade, or in uh, Fahrenheit, that's between 8 and 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Now imagine that future. We've got 400 to 800% increase in temperature, and think of the consequences uh, for uh, the humans on this planet uh, for that in terms of climate events. So what do we need to do? This is the graph at the beginning of our uh, lockdown in the UK. Uh, it's uh, if we take no action, we were going to go through our national health service capacity. We managed to flatten the curve once uh, below that amount. Uh, we're now entering our second wave. The same principles is for carbon emissions. If we uh, don't flatten the curve and we're well uh, you know, above Earth's capacity uh, at the moment, and uh, but where do we peak? That's the question. Uh, if we take no action, then obviously that is going to significantly go over Earth's capacity. We need to flatten the curve of CO2 emissions below Earth's capacity, and we know uh, at the moment we're double that, so we need to get below that uh, together, and we need to do that in the next 30 years or we're in big trouble. I've been privileged to, uh, to be the chairman of uh, the RBA Sustainable Futures Group uh, for the last couple of years. And at the time, we've also written, uh, written all the new guidance for uh, sustainability. So we got RBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, we got the 2030 Challenge, and all that is isn't integrated into the 2020 Plan of Work. So I'm going to touch on each of these briefly. First one is, uh, we can see here, is, uh, is all the guides are linked back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all 17, uh, but we've focused on 10, which we think we can manage and uh, measure on site. The other seven, we believe, are mandatory anyway. That should be part of uh, government regulations. Uh, so we're going to focus on these. Uh, we now, if we distill them down to eight sustainable outcomes, I'm just going to take you through these briefly. At the top, we've got operational energy, which is kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, we also think uh, we can measure embodied carbon on uh, uh, buildings and construction, and that's in uh, kilogram CO2 per square meter. We've got sustainable water cycle, which is in liters uh, per person per day. We've got sustainable conductivity and transport. And obviously that's one of the benefits of uh, lockdown is we're actually all doing this remotely. Uh, so we're saving lots of carbon by not traveling to, uh, to watch me. Um, uh, so that's in kilogram CO2 per person. And we've got sustainable land use and ecology. And what we're asking for design teams in the UK is any site you get, you've got to leave it in a better ecological uh, situation than when you find it. And we're really looking for a net gain of a minimum 10% increase in biodiversity and uh, maybe touching 20%. Then we got to go gold health and well-being, and we're going to touch on that in a minute, but that's absolutely critical just now in terms of uh, COVID. Uh, we've got to think beyond just the buildings. We're going to think about the communities we create and the social value that we create as well. And in the lockdown, that social value is very important uh, for our communities. Then we've got to consider the sustainable life cycle uh, cost of how we actually balance the books on this. 
So what we embed into the planner work is you take all your uh, eight outcomes and there's about 30 metrics or so uh, that are linked to that. But these are only a start for 10. You can choose your metrics with your client. And really what we're saying is use this as an aim memoir uh, to think about the outcome first. And it's a, a change in attitudes rather than just thinking about uh, taking what's been done before, but think of what's required at the end of the day. Uh, we then uh, agree those goals with the client in the stages zero and one and then integrate that into design right at the beginning of stage two. And that first few months of stage two is so critical. Sustainability can't be bolted on. It's got to be fully embedded into the design process. Then we reality check that through the design uh, phases, hand over the, con the construction to the contractor, and then we flip to our validation and dissemination route. Uh, the, then stage six is about the handover of how we uh, as a team, hand it over to the client and the user uh, to use the building. And at the end of stage six, we're asking for a, a mandatory post occupancy evaluation from architects. So just focusing on that for a sec. So this is a graduated post occupancy evaluation. Uh, it is um, best practice we, uh, we put forward now, and hopefully that we, we will make this kind of sort of mandatory in terms of building regulations, uh, or at least for chartered architects. First one is a light touch review at the end of stage six. It's a quick walk around, read the meters, uh, and actually doing a light uh, online user survey in terms of how people are feeling. I mean, is it bedding in? Is it building working as, as we thought? If there's any issues, then year two is where you do a diagnostic assessment using some more um, precise tools in terms of uh, measuring energy use and uh, occupant satisfaction. And then further, you've really got to do maybe perhaps a detailed forensic investigation in year three. And what happens is you, you do that three years and you maybe tweak things uh, when you, it's called fine tuning, but you tweak things and then you go back in and measure to see if they've worked or not. So that's the uh, <clears throat> the overall plan of work. Now, setting the 2030 challenge is setting the deadline. And we see here, if we do nothing, then we're going to be um, aiming for a plus four degrees uh, uh, temperature planet. And remember, we're only at 1.1 now. So think of the problems we're going to create for ourselves at four. Um, the UK government is set legally by a target of 2050 for net zero. And see there. And then I've been plotting on the different uh, targets of various organizations in the UK. You can see they're down to 2030, which is our target. The reason for that is we think we need 10 years to upscale our profession, uh, but we can't really build any new or unsustainable buildings beyond that part because we've got 20 years to really look at the elephant in the room, which is the is uh, retrofitting 27 million homes and total 45 million buildings in the UK. AstraZeneca are being global uh, leaders in this field and they're aiming for 2025 for their uh, net zero uh, global operations. These are the targets. I'm not going to go through all the details, but the principle is we've taken four of the critical sustainable outcomes. Uh, we've used benchmarks uh, that are currently available and we apply then a percentage reduction at 2020, 2025 and 2030. And it's a 75% reduction for operational energy. We see there in the uh, for domestic buildings, that's 35 kilowatt hours per square meter. That's what we're aiming for. And that's for regulated and unregulated energy. And body carbon is uh, it's actually a 50% reduction uh, from a 2020 target, but overall it's about 70% reduction there as well to 300 kilograms CO2 per square meter. Possible water use is a 40% reduction to 75 liters per person. Uh, per person per day and that includes rainwater which we'll come on to that in a second but in all measures we've got to think about um, uh, health in terms of post-covid world overheating daylighting and internal indoor air quality slightly different metrics for non-domestic we can see here uh, but really we're asking for a decade rated building in the uk as a display energy certificate and it's 55 kilowatt hours per square meter and then 50 percent reduction in body carbon and again 40 percent in terms of portable water use how are we doing? Uh, so we plotted these against, uh, colleagues plotted against this, the curve. We can see the, the angled line through the center there, that's ranging from 100 to 400. So that's gonna kind of spread that happens in terms of government offices. And we see the, uh, the, the 225 is, is the benchmark. And we can see right down the red line at the bottom is our target, that 55 kilowatt hours per square meter. So just focusing on how we do that, net operational energy, uh, we can see there's no shortage of energy hit the planet, it's about capturing and storing it. And what we say is retrofit first in the UK, uh, we've got to retrofit those existing buildings. 
And whatever we do, we've got to think about a fabric first approach. It's really enhancing the fabric of the building, doing most of the uh, the, the, um, the protection in terms of environmental control. Then integrate re regenerative engineering, which is really thermal recovery, uh, uh, LED linked daylighting and smart controls. Uh, and, and really the two together should be um, symbiotic. Then thinking about on-site renewables in terms of PV or air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps and so forth. And then only then when you hit that sort of uh, as best you've done, then you off offset uh, with off-site renewables. And body carbon, again, the principle here is the circular economy. This Japanese shrine using local materials uh, from, uh, you see around about that, and it's designed to just be disassembled for every 20 years as part of that ritual. And we've got to think about that and how we do that in our buildings. And that's the principles of, of the circular economy. So you see here, retrofit first is a key thing. You've got to think about a whole life carbon analysis of your buildings. Look at local low embodied materials. Think about healthy and ethical materials as well. The two really kind of come together. And then finally, you've got to then offset uh, with uh, offsite renewables. Sustainable water cycle. Uh, the first two are, as a matter of course, we should all be doing that now. Uh, but really, what we're uh, really urging everybody to do is to increase the rainwater uh, storage capacity and recycling uh, for the building. And if we all do it for every every building we do in terms of retrofit, that will help uh, reduce the burden on the infrastructure. That's on supply and also on uh, attenuation in terms of water. And it really dealing with that, hopefully, that peak um, uh, occasions. And remember, this uh, climate events are going to happen more regularly and reg you know only last week in the UK you know a month's worth of rain uh, you know uh, actually sort of fell within just a few hours good health and well-being absolutely top of the agenda in terms of where we are in terms of COVID and really the principles are um, very simple it's contact outside and it's contact with nature that really is where we're uh, where we're really kind of developed and that's what we're um, evolved to, to really kind of link with. Uh, good density is absolutely critical in terms of the return to work, indoor air quality, and really it's, it's really moving away from the sealed building. Um, I think sealing the building and actually trying to solve this by a mechanical system. We've got to do that obviously in terms of buildings that are sealed, but we've got to think beyond that. We've got to think about buildings which actually have um, opening uh, windows and vents to the outside. And we can see here courtyard right in the center of London. Good daylighting, good adaptive thermal comfort, acoustics, and obviously inclusivity is absolutely mandatory. So sharing all of that, all of the things we try to do is linking with um, definitions and the targets and metrics. Uh, really linking with our kind of, sort of organisations of UKGBC and Letty and others, we try and sort of get uh, uh, speak with one voice and clarity to the profession. And what we're saying here is uh, net zero is the operational carbon in the middle, see in the grey, uh, plus the embodied carbon, and that creates the whole life carbon. And we're trying to um, uh, align that route in terms of how we measure and uh, how we offset. There's a range of tools here we can see from poor accuracy right to good accuracy. And we're trying to say and uh, really lobby for the uh, ditching the EPCs and moving to more pacifice plus uh, in terms of dynamic modeling for um, uh, we can see for non-domestic buildings and aiming for design performance tools and that's uh, taking uh, developing the neighbors tool for the UK. So can we do it? Well here's some examples of uh, where we, we have done it. Uh, this is Energy Sprong from Netherlands. Now they're building these houses, uh, retrofitting these houses in Nottingham just now. And we see there it really is taking uh, a very poorly performing existing building, um, applying external insulation, and we see the PV there as well. So it's Pacifice Plus, and that achieves that net zero uh, on site. And we need to do that uh, 27 million times uh, by 2050. If you need to build new, this is an example of uh, uh, last year's Sterling Prize winner. See here, it's uh, Michael Richards, Christmas Street. And again, that achieved our 20th challenge. 90% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions embodied uh, almost on our, our kind of 2030 challenge in terms of 300 kilograms CO2 per meter squared. Now that was built for 100, 180 pounds per square foot uh, for this, uh, this part of uh, England is actually quite uh, good value. So, so really we're doing this, uh, creating amazing value for, um, uh, for the community at, at really no extra cost. And we're actually having a, a multiple benefits on this. And the families have moved in here. Many of them have been lifted out to fuel poverty as well. So think of the social uh, value uh, that's actually created in terms of uh, creating a, a net zero future as well. 
If we add PVs onto that, uh, the previous scheme didn't have uh, significant PVs. If we do a passive ice plus, which is using passive ice principles plus renewables, and this is a beer architects uh, house and lark rise, that's a net positive building. We can see there that that any extra uh, surplus energy is used to power the electric car. That is a blueprint of the future. Uh, we need to scale up though, so that actually um, in terms of most of our housing, existing housing, uh, achieves that same balance as well. This is a slightly larger residential scheme for um, uh, college in Cambridge. And we see here, this has hit our 2030 target, almost in terms of 70% reduction. And it's used a uh, very simple um, you know, uh, strategies here. We see that it's, um, it's a very simple glazing ratio, uh, which again is quite cost effective, external shading, uh, very good orientation, but it's all in the detail in terms of the, uh, the thickness of the walls, in terms of U value and air tightness and so forth. And the PV has been sensibly integrated into the roof. So again, this is a very sensible building. Again, in terms of cost wise, this is uh, right in uh, terms of not that much more in terms of the, uh, the, the benchmark for these types of buildings. And it's achieved that um, almost a 2030 challenge. So at that scale, we think we can do it as well. Uh, this building, again, larger as well. This is um, a university building, Enterprise Centre, again, in Norwich. Uh, and then we can see here, this has achieved, uh, we see a 68% reduction. Now, that uh, was without really uh, significant renewables or heat pumps. Now, if the heat pumps plus renewables were put in there, this would actually smash our 2030 target. This would achieve 20. That's the actual energy use of the building for the last few years, 70 kilowatt hours per square metre. So this is the future. We can do it. And these architects have done it. You can see there at the medium cost of university buildings, this costs no more than the average of a university building. This is our challenge. We must um, all do this in terms of aspire to this for our future designs. The last project i just leave you with is Everyman Theatre in Liverpool. And uh, this is a Sterling Prize award-winning scheme. It's a, a, almost achieved a 70% reduction in terms of carbon emissions. And this is done by uh, using stack, uh, passive stack ventilation in terms of lots of taking out lots of kind of uh, mechanical systems. So the principle here is really, we can deliver beautiful buildings that are award-winning and they can perform at the same time. This is the true future of how we judge uh, good architecture. I'm just going to leave you with a couple of bullet points. First one is really uh, approach your existing clients and carry out um, some, or offer to carry out some post oxygen evaluation of the buildings you completed. This is uh, not only makes good business sense, but could save up to 20% of the energy use of the building. Target net zero whole life carbon, prioritize deep retrofit, target a decade non-domestic uh, non building, or if it's a, a, a domestic building, target a pacifist performance level. Reduce uh, water use by 40%, target a well building standard or equivalent, uh, target significantly enhancing that biodiversity, and we're talking about 10% to 20% net gain. And if you're in the UK, really urge you to sign up to the RB2030 challenge. Thanks very much for listening.